pictures are printed in your bulletin. So you can just open your bulletin and, and read with us together. The scripture is Hebrews chapter 11, verse 24 through 27. And the subject is, what did Moses choose? By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. <laughs> Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect under the recompense of the reward. Thank you. Be seated, please. The nation of Israel, which consisted at that time of Jacob and his twelve sons had gone down into Egypt because of the great famine that was on the land. The only place they could get corn was in Egypt. And Joseph rose to a place of prominence, became the prime minister of Egypt, and all was well for a time. However, there arose a king who knew not Joseph. And the Egyptians became alarmed at the growth rate of the children of Israel. So the king issued an edict that all baby boys must be murdered, put to death. And in Genesis, Pharaoh charged all his people, saying, every son that is born, ye shall cast into the river, and every daughter ye shall save alive. Moses was one of these sons. In verse 23, by faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents, because they saw he was a proper child, and they were not afraid of the king's commandments. You'll notice that Moses was hid in the home for three months. However, it became evident that they would not be able to keep him hidden any longer. So they took Moses down to the Nile River in a little basket and set that little basket in the Nile River full of crocodiles. And it so happened that Pharaoh's daughter, with her attendants, came down to the Nile River. And just as they passed by that spot, Moses cried. And when that baby cried, they stopped and looked into the reeds. And there was a little basket with a baby in it. And they picked up that basket with that little baby and carried it up out of the Nile River before the queen of Egypt. And she said, I will take this child and raise it as my adopted son. And she took Moses into the palace and raised him. And he was in line to become the great successor and king of all Egypt. However, one day he saw the abuse of the Egyptians upon his own people. And knowing that he was a Hebrew, he could no longer forbear, and he killed that abuser, that Egyptian, and fled into the desert, where he remained for 40 years. And this was the man that God had chosen to be the deliverer of Israel. Israel was in slavery 400 years in the land of Egypt and God sends Moses down to deliver the people from their bondage 
Now, you'll notice it said that Moses was hid three months. Moses has been called the hidden man. God hid Moses seven different times in the Bible. First, he was hidden in the house where he was born. Hebrews 11.23 Then he was hidden in the Nile River among the reeds in Exodus chapter 2 and verse 3. Then he was hidden in the desert in Exodus chapter 3 and verse 1, the Sinai Desert. Then he was hidden in the mount, Exodus 32 verse 1. Then he was hidden in the wilderness as he led the children of Israel, Exodus 15.22. In the sixth place, he was hidden in the rock where he saw uh, the great rock that was cleft, and there he had a revelation from God. Exodus 33, 22. Then in the seventh place, he was hidden in the grave. Deuteronomy 34, 6. So he was indeed the hidden man. God was always hiding Moses. And when God has something unique for a man to do. He usually trains him by hiding him from the public. As John the Baptist spent his time in the wilderness until it came time for him to step forth and announce the coming of the Lord. So that's been God's method to hide his servant from the public until he's ready for him to step forth before the public and then perform whatever work God has called him to do. Now God had promised Abraham <clears throat> that Israel would be delivered. They would be set free in the fourth generation. And it just so happened that Moses was in the fourth generation. And that's why his parents were not afraid. They knew that God had chosen this baby to be the deliverer of his people from the land of Egypt. Moses lived 120 years, exactly. And his life is divided into three periods. The first 40 years was in the land of Egypt when he learned to be somebody. He sat next to Pharaoh on the throne. He was in charge of all of Egypt. And the second 40 years was spent on the desert, herding sheep. There he learned to be a nobody. And then thirdly, he led the children of Israel for 40 years through the wilderness. And there he learned that God was everybody. Moses was a mighty man. The writer of the book of Hebrews points out in our text today, Moses' great choice. I'll read it again. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. There are two great words here, choosing and refusing. Those two words sum up the life of Moses. Moses refuses one road in order to take the other road. He was a man of decision. Elijah, standing before the nation of Israel and contesting the false gods of the heathen, said to Israel, Choose ye this day whom ye will serve. If, if Baal be God, follow him and go to hell. If God be God, follow him and go to heaven. But choose ye this day whom ye will serve. Always there is a choice to be made in the Christian life. There are two special elements in Moses' decision, choosing and refusing. 
Moses, when he was come to years, refused. He said, I will no longer be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He refused the adoption. He rejected it. It was a full-fledged no. He didn't equivocate. He didn't stutter. He didn't mess around. He said no. How we need men and women today that know how to say no. It's so easy to say yes. So easy to give in to temptation, to sin. So easy to take the easy road and shun the hard road. But we need men and women today that know how to make decisions and make those decisions in the right way, not in the wrong way. Joseph is an example. <clears throat> when Pharaoh's daughter, or rather Potiphar's daughter, attempted to entice Moses and Joseph, they both said no. These are men that knew how to say no. Daniel knew how to say no. The Bible says he chose not to defile himself with the king's meat. <clears throat> Rebecca's decision to go to Isaac and become his bride was a decision she had to make. The old servant said, choose today. Will you go or no? And she said, I will go. She made a decision. Her parents and her kinfolk tried to talk her out of it. But she said, I will go. A decision was made. She crossed the Rubicon. There was no turning back. I will go and become the bride of Isaac. And then Jacob's decision to go back to Bethel. It was time to go home. He knew that. God was leading him back to Bethel. And he said, we will go back to Bethel. The decision was made. Jacob's decision was made. And then Rebecca's decision. And Ruth's decision to go with Naomi. She came to the fork of the road. Naomi was going back to Bethlehem. To the God of her people. And Orpah turned and went back to her heathen gods. And Ruth said, I will clave unto thee. Whither thou goest, I will go. And whither thou lodgest, I will lodge. And thy God shall be my God. And thy people shall be my people. And she made the decision there at the crossroads to go to Bethlehem and to live with Naomi and Naomi's people and to serve Naomi's God. A decision was made. The prodigal son, when he came to himself and saw himself in the hog pen of life, said, I will arise and go to my father. And I will say unto him, My father, I have sinned against thee and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. But the father said unto him, This my son was dead and is alive. Kill the fatted calf. Let us rejoice and be merry. But a decision was made in the home pen. I will arise and go to my father. And that decision was followed through. And he went back home to the rejoicing of his father. The three Hebrew children were faced with an ultimatum. They were told by Nebuchadnezzar that they must bow down to the image of Nebuchadnezzar. And they said, Be it known unto you, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor bow down to them. At the cost of the risk of their life, they said, Be it known unto you, O king, our God is able to deliver us. But if not, if he does not choose to deliver us from the fiery furnace, nevertheless, we will not serve thy gods. Decisions. Costly decisions. Life giving decisions were made throughout the people of God 
throughout the Old and the New Testament, the twelve apostles, with the exception of one, were all martyred and put to death because they would not give up their faith in their Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now Moses' decision was costly. There was much to give up. He gave up the highest social position in all of Egypt. He who stood in line to be the next Pharaoh. <laughs> he had all of the wealth and all of the Egyptian court under him. <clears throat> Excuse me. He had the opulence of the palace. He was in line to become the greatest man in the world of that day. But he made a decision, refused the daughter of Pharaoh, refused Pharaoh, refused the kingdom, and departed from Egypt. He gave up the highest social position. It would be like a man today giving up the position of a king. That's what he gave up. The pleasures and the treasures of Egypt. All the opulence and the wealth of Egypt, which was the richest country in the world at that time. He turned his back on all of it. And he made a decision and never went back on it. Secondly, he gave up all the pleasures of Egypt. Egypt was a pleasure land. Pleasures and treasures were the two things that he turned his back on. All the wealth of Egypt, all the pleasures of Egypt, he turned his back on it for God. When he turned his back, the decision was made, the Rubicon was crossed, he never went back. Thirdly, he gave up all the treasures of Egypt. Egypt was the granary of the world. Moses gave it all up, turned his back on all of it for the God of heaven. Now Moses did more than say no. He also said yes. Choosing rather. There was an alternative. He saw the alternative and he chose the alternative. You don't become a Christian by don'ts. We are to say no to the lower so we can say yes to the higher. The cost of this decision was not measured alone by what he gave up. Let me stop and say he was already a believer. You're not saved by your decision. You're saved by God's decision to save you. Decision making follows salvation. It does not precede it. We love Him because He first loved us. And God takes the initiative when He saves a sinner. But the cost of that decision was not measured just by what He gave up. What did He give up that He could say yes to? He chose suffering. He knew it meant suffering. He knew it meant abandonment to the desert for 40 years. But he chose to suffer. And if you're a Christian, God has chosen to let you do some suffering. Because it is through suffering that God builds great saints whom the Lord loved. He chased them oftentimes. And God builds strong men and women through suffering. And suffering is the appointed lot of God's people. We have suffered in Christianity down through the ages. It is the hallmark of a Christian that he will suffer. Sometimes he suffers financial loss. Sometimes he suffers physical loss. Sometimes he suffers in other ways. But he always has to face suffering in this life. This is our day of suffering. But our day of glory is coming. So Moses 
takes the road that he knows will lead to real suffering. With eyes wide open, he makes a choice. <clears throat> How did Moses come to make this choice? The Bible says in verse 27, By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Moses saw the invisible God. <clears throat> he saw the hand of God on his life. And it was seeing that God day by day work in his life that he made that choice. He made it by faith. Everything we do in the Christian life has to be by faith. We are building a new church building. We'll be ready to move into it in the middle of March. And we started with very little money, almost nothing. Half of it, more than half of it has already come in. And by faith, the rest of it will come in. It's no problem worrying about money if you have faith. We have a God who doesn't let us down. He never does. And he hasn't let us down and he won't. So we trust in God. We don't trust in people. We don't trust in others. We trust in God. God provides. And Moses saw the invisible God and trusted in him. And God never let Moses down. He had a clear eye for distinguishing between right and wrong. You know, it isn't hard to distinguish between right and wrong when you have a clear eye. A clear eye comes from God. God gives us the insight and the knowledge and the understanding that some things are not right for a Christian that the world can do. The world can do things that are legal, but not necessarily righteous. But the Christian can not only not do things that are illegal, there are some things that are legal that he cannot do by conscience sake. I had a gambler one time ask if he could join our church. He was a gambler in Las Vegas. He said, I'll give the church a lot of money if uh, I join this church. I said, sir, unless you give up gambling, you can't join this church. Now, we could have used some money. We could have used a wealthy donor. But we're not going to compromise moral standards for money. You see, we have a God who supplies all our needs. He had a clear eye to distinguish between right and wrong. And then he didn't use Joseph as an excuse. He could have said, well, Joseph stayed in Egypt. All right for me to stay in Egypt. I'll use Joseph as my example. But you see, Joseph was in Egypt by the will of God. And therefore, Joseph was there in the right way because that's where God wanted Joseph, that he might save the nation of Israel. He knew also that the pleasures and gains of sin are only temporary and transitory. They don't last. 2 Corinthians 4.18 says, While we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. You see, sin has pleasure. I've heard preachers say there's no pleasure in sin. Oh yes, there is. That's why people do it. They wouldn't do it if they didn't get some pleasure out of it. So they do it. It's not right to tell people there's no pleasure in sin. There is. But in the end, it stingeth like an adder. It biteth like a serpent. In the end, it will destroy you. It may be pleasurable for a little while, but it will destroy you. And Moses knew that all these treasures pleasures of Egypt were only transitory. He knew they wouldn't last. He had his eye on something that was eternal. 
Something that would last forever. And he chose that. He had a keen eye for the things that are of real value. What is value? You have a car, you have a house, you have money in the bank, and you consider that a value? It may be gone tomorrow, but there are things that are eternal, and they superintend and supersede the things that are temporal of this world. Moses knew the difference between the things that are temporal and the things that are eternal. And Moses looked away from everything else to the coming reward. He knew there was a reward in heaven for those who serve God. And the Bible says, for he had respect unto the recompense, that's the payment, of the reward. If you serve God, you may be poor in this world. You may be poor in this world's goods. But if you serve God, you will be rich in heaven. And I would rather be rich in heaven than to be rich down here. Because to be rich down here is worthless. But to be rich up there is glory beyond compare. There are riches. And I'm not talking about gold and silver. But there are riches beyond compare for the child of God when he gets to his eternal home in heaven. When he walks down the streets that are paved with gold. He walks through the eternal gates that are made of pearl. And he walks up to the throne of God and bows before his Creator. And he enjoys his eternal home. John Wesley great Methodist preacher said he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to save what he cannot lose. What was the outcome of Moses' decision? It gave him glory. It did something for him spiritually. When he made the right choice, it gave him a shining face. When he came down from the Mount of receiving the Ten Commandments, his face was shining with the glory of God. And the people had to put a garment of some kind over his face because they could not bear to look on the face of Moses because his face was shining with the reflective glory of God. He had been with God. And some of that glory had rubbed off on Moses. And they could not look on his face. And when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come nigh unto him. 2 Corinthians 3, 7 says, So that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance. Being with God did something for Moses. When you spend time with God, people know it. Now what does Moses' life and decision teach me and you? It teaches us that it always pays to do the right thing. It always pays. Maybe not on Monday, not on Tuesday, or Thursday or Friday, but it always pays. Sooner or later, right always rises from the dust. Right always wins in the long run. It also teaches us that doing right can result in suffering. If you do the right thing, you will suffer often for it. Thirdly, doing right is always rewarded. 
he eventually entered the land of Canaan and dwelt there. And in the fourth place, doing right reward is sometimes delayed. The rewards don't always come at the same time you do the good deed. Sometimes it waits a long time, but the reward will come. It is promised by the living God. And then in the fifth place, it teaches us that doing right usually means giving up something. To do the right thing means giving something up that you cherish. <coughs> giving something up that you love and cling to. And if God says give it up, you have to make a choice. Usually it means giving up something. In the sixth place, doing the right thing usually involves fighting. We do not have a lily pad Christianity. True Christianity is a rough road. I never preach to people that being a Christian, everything will be rosy. Everything will be fine. No, it's going to be a battle. It's going to be a rough road. It's going to be a hard road. And the sissies and the incompetence will fall by the wayside. But a true born again Christian will face the storm and not run from it. He will go through it and win on the other side. But it usually involves a fight. We have to fight the good fight of faith. We have to fight temptation. We have to fight sometimes our own relatives. We have to fight sometimes the people of this world. I'm not talking about fisticuffs or being pugilistic. I'm talking about fighting the fight of faith when the whole world is against you. Somebody said one time to the great martyr John Huss, the whole world is against you. He said that I'm against the whole world. I'm for God. And if it costs me my life, I'll give that. If it costs me my fortune, which I don't even have yet, I'll give that. But I'm not going to give up. I'm not a quitter. I can get along with almost anybody with a quitter. In the seventh place, doing right requires courage. Moses had the courage. You know there was a time and a moment when God called Moses and Moses said, I can't speak, I'm not eloquent. Why don't you send my brother Aaron? Aaron is eloquent. He's an orator. He can throw those words out. And Why don't you send Aaron to Egypt to free the people? He'd do a better job than me. God said, no, no, no. I'll be with your mouth. Who made your mouth, Moses? Go, I will be with your mouth. And Moses got pretty eloquent down there in Egypt when he faced Pharaoh. But it requires courage. Famous preacher said one time to his students, do right. If the stars fall, do right. In the eighth place, doing right often means standing alone. If no one else stands with you, stand. In the ninth place, doing right requires spiritual discernment. We have to know what is right and what is wrong. It's very easy to find out. We have a book that has ten little rules in it. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. 
And those ten rules are called the Ten Commandments. And they cover every kind of sin or failure that can be faced. If you want to know the difference between right and wrong, read the Ten Commandments, which the Supreme Court has thrown out of the courthouse to the shame of the nation. Read the Ten Commandments, and you will know whether it's right or whether it's wrong. And one last thing, Moses teaches that someday we'll die. Someday we'll die. But for the Christian, there is no death. It's a departure to be with the Lord. When a Christian gives up this life, he hasn't died. His body dies, goes back to the grave. But he doesn't die. He goes to heaven to be with Christ and to live in glory with his Savior. So he doesn't really die. It's just the body that dies. Someday the body will live again in resurrection glory. God will raise the bodies of his people from the grave. And the next thing is that when you do the right thing and you live for God, God will not let the devil get you. Did you know that the devil tried to get the body of Moses? He fought with Michael the archangel over the body of Moses when Moses died. The Bible says in Jude, verse 9, Yet Michael the archangel, when disputing and contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. Durst not bring against him a raving accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. There was a tug of war. There was a battle over the body of Moses. The devil wanted Moses' body. I don't know what he wanted to do with it. Probably to proclaim his victory over Christianity. But he didn't get Moses' body because Moses had an undertaker. You know who Moses' undertaker was? God. The Bible tells us that God buried Moses himself. Listen to this. Deuteronomy 34 and verse 5, 6, and 7. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab according to the word of the Lord. And he, now the antecedent of Lord, of he is Lord. The Lord buried him in a valley in the land of Moab over against Beth Peor, but no man knoweth of his sepulcher unto this day. And Moses was 120 years old when he died, and his eye was not dim, nor his natural force abated. God was Moses' undertaker. He didn't let the devil get Moses' body. Moses was a great man. He's always been an example to me. If I get a little discouraged, I, I go and read Moses. And I see what he had to do and what he had to put up with. <coughs> and it encourages me. And when I think of all the things that God did for Moses, it overwhelms me. Cecil Francis Alexander wrote a poem about Moses, about his burial. And this is what he wrote about the burial of Moses. By Nebo's lonely mountain, on this side Jordan's wave, in a vale in the land of Moab, there lies a lonely grave. But no man dug that sepulcher, and no man saw it ere, for the angels of God upturned the sod and laid the dead man there. There was the grandest funeral that ever passed on earth, but no man heard the trampling or saw the train go forth. Noiselessly as the daylight comes when the night is done, and the crimson streak on ocean's cheek grows into the great sun. This was the bravest warrior 
that ever buckled sword. This was the most gifted poet that ever breathed a word. And there Earth's philosopher traced with his golden pen on the deathless page truths half so aged as he wrote down for men. And the dark rock pines like tossing plumes o'er his beard to wave and God's own hand in that lonely land to lay him in his grave. In that deep grave without a name, whence his uncoffined clay shall break again most wondrous thought before the judgment day. And stand with glory wrapped around on the hills he never trod and speak of the strife that won our life through Christ the incarnate God. O oh, lonely grave in Moab's land, O oh, dark Beth Peor's hill, speak to these curious hearts of ours and teach them to be still. God hath his mysteries of grace, ways that we cannot tell. He hides them deep like the hidden sleep of him he loved so well. I trust that this message on Moses might be a challenge to you. It might be an encouragement to you to follow this great man in making right decisions. Let us stand together, please, and be dismissed in prayer. Put it down, would you dismiss us, please, in prayer? Thank you for thank you for another great message of the Lord God. Pray you continue to bless us, but not only for us to be hearers, but to be doers of our word. And so, Lord, I pray you help us to study the life of Moses and great men like that. And from that, we do, it does strengthen our faith and helps us know that, that the God that did those things uh, yesterday, he does them now, and he'll continue forever to do them. So help us, Lord, to have a faith built to work. We're willing to make the proper decisions based upon uh, based upon the truth of God. Go with us as we part company, and bless us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.